holy is the Lord God Almighty. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Bless your name, O oh God. Hallelujah. We glorify you. Thank you, Jesus. Praise his name. Praise his name. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord God. Glorify you, King Jesus. You're worthy of the praise. Worthy of the honor, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Jesus. We praise you, Lord God. You're worthy, King Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord. Thank you, Lord God. You're Lord of all. Hey, God bless you, Michael. Thank you for tuning in, young man. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. We're going to get started in a few minutes. Give other people a chance to come on. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord God. Mm. How you doing, young man? Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. Glory to God. Praise Him. Jesus. Such a wonderful day. Peaceful, relaxing day. Amen. Just enjoyed myself today, just relaxing in the presence of the Lord. Hey, I appreciate that. Amen. Well, the Bible says where there's two or three gathered in his name, he's in the midst so you and i are here at this moment i'm gonna go ahead and get started and i pray that this would be enriching to your spirit as it is mine that god will empower you by the holy ghost to gain wisdom knowledge understanding insight into the mysteries of the gospel of jesus christ our lord so I'm going to open up in a word of prayer. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you, Lord God, for this day that you have created. I thank you for this opportunity, oh God, to teach your word. I pray tonight, Father, you speak by divine revelation from the Holy Spirit, a word that will help change our lives, change our hearts, oh God, for the better. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Forgive us for our sins. Knowing unknowingly, Father God, and sanctify our hearts and minds, Father, by the Spirit of living God. We have nothing to hinder us from hearing your word tonight, Father. Help us remove the business of the day from our minds, that our minds would be focused on you, God, that you would speak by the unction of the Holy Ghost, O oh God. The word that will help inspire, that will edify, that will build us up in our faith to trust you all the more. And I thank you, O oh God as we become the receptacles to receive the word that you pour into us, O oh God, the word of life. For you said the words that I speak unto you, their spirit and their life. Let this word fill our cups till it overflow, that we have to share this good news with somebody else about the love of God, 
that he has demonstrated in our lives. And I thank you for it, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I'm glad you joined in tonight, uh, my brother, my spiritual son. God bless you. Uh, last week, I've been teaching, I uh, started teaching chapter 8 in the book, Debate of Satan. It's a very inspirational book because it deals with different tactics and um, baits the enemies, uh, lures us in to cause us to sin against God. And the Spirit of God is making us aware that we need to be on guard every day of our lives of the tactics of the enemy, how he comes in a subtle way to distract and deter us from our purpose and the plan God has for our life. Last week, we talked about when the enemy shakes, it, it is to destroy what God has, but God has a different purpose. When the enemy shakes, it is to destroy, but God has a different purpose. And one thing we learned from that is that the enemy he will cause turbulence in our lives to shake us up, to get us out of character, make us become angry real, real quick, to become offensive and retaliate with other people. But God himself has the power and the ability to turn our hearts towards him, to cause things to work out for the glory of God, for a purpose in our lives to make us better. And many times, if we're not paying attention when God begins to speak by the Holy Spirit, we're quick to fly off the handle when things are not going the way we expect it to go. All that can be shaken will be shaken. And sometimes God has to allow things to shake us up, to stir us up, to motivate us, to drive us into our purpose and the plan and the vision he has for our life to be fulfilled. Until we allow circumstances and situations to manifest in our lives, we get complacent. We become comfortable in our mess, in our lifestyles, in our habits, in our addictions. We become comfortable. And we talked about last week concerning how Simon Peter and the disciples became offended when Jesus began to declare to them that he was going to die on this cross for mankind. And because of that, they had a selfish pride a selfish pride that made them get upset because Jesus made the statement that he's going to be going to suffer many things of the of the Pharisees and the scribes and be persecuted, you know, and be beaten and you know and, and murdered, put to death, all different things that he declared was going to happen to him. Disciples became offended because they had a selfish, prideful heart. I was looking at something. Um, Pastor Terry sent me. Uh, um, this morning, and it's seven symptoms of a prideful heart, seven symptoms of a prideful heart. And as I was looking in the word of God, one of the scriptures came to mind is Proverbs 11, chapter verse two, Proverbs 11, chapter verse two. And that scripture says, when pride cometh, then cometh shame, but with the lowly is wisdom. When pride cometh, then comes shame. Why? Because I become embarrassed of my response, the way I treat other people, because I'm so stuck on myself. But when wisdom shows up in our lives, it brings you to a place of humility, where you're willing to let go of your pride, let go of your attitude, let go of the things that you feel that's self-satisfying to build yourself and care less about anybody else, it turns your focus to a concern and a care for other people and how you begin to love and care for them the way God wants you to treat them. Another scripture is Proverbs chapter 8, verse 13. It says, The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride and arrogancy, and the evil way, and the froward mouth do I hate. And this is what God says about a person who's prideful. He said they're arrogant, they have evil ways, and they have a bad mouth, forward, sinful mouth. And God says they have a lying mouth. That word forward is dealing with lying. And God says he, he hates those type of people because of the behavior of the sin nature. But he loves the individual. Here I just said, he hates the people who have those type of behavior patterns, but he loved the individual. And that is so awesome to know that God loves us 
even in our mess ups and our hang ups. It says pride is universal. Something we all deal with as ancient as Adam and as relevant as the morning news. Yet we don't always see our own pride, which weaves like weave, weeds around our lives. So it weaves, it, it spins, it, it begins to manifest weeds in our lives when we're prideful. Oh, we see it in obvious ways. We can be blind to its, its deception, subversive way in our hearts. We know that the disease, we know the disease, but we don't recognize the symptoms. So pride becomes a spiritual disease in your heart. And if you don't pay, pay attention, you'll never recognize the symptoms. That's why we, we need the insight of our spiritual great physician to reveal symptoms of pride and rescue us from it. That is so awesome how we stand in need of the Savior, the Redeemer, the Lord of glory, the Prince of peace, the everlasting Father, the great I am, to show up in our lives to deliver us from this type of behavior that we allow us to be entwined in by the enemy, to pull us away from our purpose. And one thing I realized, a prideful person is a selfish person. And the reason I say that is because you always think about what can you do to build yourself? What can you do to please yourself? What can you do to, to make your house better? And you don't care about what anybody else got. So if I see somebody hungry in the street, I'll, I'm so prideful, I'm not giving them anything. I'm going to walk past them because I don't want to help them because I need what I got for myself. And that's what pride does. It makes you become selfish when you focus on self-gratification. Knowing that pride is a form of fear. Seven symptoms of a prideful heart. Here are seven symptoms of, of pride I've been seeing in God's word as the spirit works in my own life. Number one is fear. Pride is the root of fear and, and anxiety. When we refuse to humble, humble, uh, humbly rest in God's sovereign care, Fear simultaneously reveals our lack of trust and our poisonous self-reliance. My God, my God, my God. That's deep. Our prideful heart is a root of fear and anxiety. When we refuse to humble ourselves and rest in God's sovereign care, it becomes poisonous and we become self-reliance. So I, I'm, I'm all about me. I want you to help me, but I'm not going to help you. I want you to do for me, but I'm not going to do for you. We fear because we don't have faith in the Lord. And we're enormously preoccupied with ourselves. And we don't have control. And one thing about a pride person, they think they have control. So they have a false comfort, a false illusion of control. When all the time you're really out of control. When Peter stepped out in the stormy sea to come to Jesus, he was walking in a humble faith. But when he gazed, when his gaze shifted to his circumstances and self-preservation, he trusted in himself, became afraid, and began to sink. It was Jesus who saved him while admonishing him, Oh, you little faith, why did you doubt? So many times, when we trust in our own abilities, we neglect, we neglect God's ability to help us. Because I feel I can do everything in my life to satisfy myself with the absence of God in my life. Entitlement. Number two, entitlement. Self-sacrifice stems from a humble heart. Entitlement is rooted in a prideful heart. The core of the gospel is that we are not entitled to anything except just punishment for our sins. Romans chapter 3, verse 23, and Romans 6, chapter 23, verse. So we deserve our sin, yet we deceive ourselves thinking we're better than we are, so we deserve better than what we have and with other people. So we got to be careful 
how subtle a pride heart can be that would cause you to get to the place where you neglect your own sinful issue in your life and want to always find fault in everybody else. And God was saying to me when I read this, he said, yet we deceive ourselves into thinking we're better than we are, so we deserve better than we have. So when I have my focus on a pride heart to where I feel I'm better than you, I'm more skilled than you, I'm more knowledgeable than you, I'm more wise, wiser than you are because I spent time studying God's word. I spent time in theology school. I got a better job than you can ever get in your life. I have the six-figure numbers in, in my finances, and, and you never match to where I am. So pride becomes I'm entitled to all the stuff that I worked so hard to get in my life, even though it was God who's the one that blessed me to get it. So I don't give God the glory I give myself the praise because I am the one who put in the work and the effort to become who I am today, very successful. We have to be careful. Ingratitude, number three, ingratitude is an ungrateful heart. Our proud hearts, we say we are good, that we should get what we want. If we, want, if we, do, if we don't, we justify in our ingratitude. If we're uncomfortable or inconvenienced in any way, we can complain. It is our right. Humility recognizes that God is good and, and he gives us what he knows we need, so we have no reason to be ungrateful. There is nothing we lack. Why? There's nothing you and I can ever lack in our lives because our Heavenly Father says if we're better, we're better than the sparrows. He said we're better than the little bitty birds. So how much more will our Heavenly Father give unto us what we have need of? He said, can you by worry if you add one cubit of statue to your life or, or make yourself better by yourself without the absence of God? No. He says, he feeds the sparrow, he'll take care of you too. So it's very important that we recognize the spirit of the enemy that wants to bring us a place of deception to think, I don't need God. People-pleasing, people-pleasing. And I'm just doing the highlights of this, these, these seven steps. I'm not going to read all of it because it's pretty lengthy. But people-pleasing. Pride is self-worship and self-preservation. Self-security. I'm secured, and no matter what cost it means to hurt somebody else to get what I want. And people-pleasing it's a direct result of pride. Some think people pleasing is a positive trait because they're so clearly concerned with serving others. But that belief is nothing more than a sneaky sheepskin we put, put over the wolf's wolfish habits or behavior. People pleasing is all about self-satisfaction fearing man no more than God, and seeking the fleeting happiness that comes from man's approval. So if I'm a people pleaser, I want you to see what I do. So if I have this the CEO position of a job, I want you to glorify me. I want you to acknowledge where I'm at in my position. I want you to acknowledge the wealth that I have, the best house I have, the best cars I drive, the best suits I wear, I want you to give me all the praise. Don't give God the praise. I want the praise. So that's what people please and do. So I want you to look at everything I'm doing so you please me. Instead of me pleasing you the way God wants me to do to help you, I want you to give me your approval. Jesus had a problem. We talked about this before in previous lessons. Uh, Jesus said when you he said the scribes and Pharisees when they pray, they stand in the street on the street corners and in the synagogues so they can be be a praise of their much speaking. And he said, Don't be like the hypocrites, they have their reward. People pleasing is individuals who have their selfish rewards. And no matter what cost it means to step over somebody else to get what I want, I'm going to do it whether I hurt you or I push you out the way to get what I want. 
I might want your wife. I might want your husband. If I have to do any cunning thing to do to take them from you, I'm going to do that. And we have to be careful of that subtle spirit of the enemy, just like he did in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, when he came to Eve in the Garden of Eden, began to test her about the word of God, what God had told her not to eat of the tree of good and evil. He said, did not God tell you not to eat of any tree in the Garden of Eden or the fruit of the tree in the Garden of Eden? And, and God never told her that. God gave them specific order. You can eat from any tree in the garden, but the tree of, of good and evil, tree of knowledge, don't eat it. And that's how the enemy does. He comes in a subtle, cunning, crafty way to manipulate you to sin against God. So people pleasing are individuals who lack humility. They're stuck in selfishness, and God trying to break that spirit off their minds and their hearts, is it becomes like a bull, a raging bull. You're trying to turn that bull away from attacking, but the bull keeps coming at you. I used to watch the Manadors on one of them bull, bull fighting shows, and the Manador, we nicely dressed up in his, his, his slick outfit, and he stand before a bull with a red cloth. That red cloth will cause that bull to get enraged and to come to attack him. The red cloth, he will hold out there at a side angle to get this bull to identify and come so he can attack this bull to take him down. And that's what the enemy does in our lives. He has set the thing before you as a bait. That's why I love the bait of Satan, this book, because he puts baits before us to distract and deter you from your vision and your fo focus on what God has instructed you to do. Prideful people are prayerlessness. They, they, number five, they're prayerlessness. Pride deceives us into thinking we can do life on our own and that we're capable, independent, unstoppable, and self-reliant. We think we don't need God every hour, that we don't need his help, his grace, his mercy, his courage, and his hope. So we surely don't need to pray. You have a lot of people go through the motions of church rituals. They come to church, but they don't pray. They come to church to hear somebody else pray, hear somebody else preach a word. They don't read their Bibles. They don't spend time in the presence of God for themselves. They're not seeking his face. They're not concentrating. Why? Because I'm selfish. And then they make an excuse. I don't know what you know. So I don't think God is going to hear my prayers when I pray. I heard people tell me that before. They said, Pastor, I need you to pray for me. Because I feel that you have a better connection of reaching God than what I have. So when you pray, God will hear your prayers, but he's not going to hear mine. And I told them this one point. I said, what makes you think God doesn't hear you? I said, you come to God in humility and you come to God in the way you know the best way to pray and you seek God's face the way you know how God himself will answer your prayer. Why? Because he knows a broken spirit, a contrite heart, he will not despise. If I come to God broken, and it goes to even relation. We talked last week about marriages. And one thing God spoke to me today, I was lying in the bed, and I was talking to my cousin, uh, Jabbar, and I told him, God spoke to me, that you are never to engage in a relationship with anybody who's not of your equal or greater, that, that, that comes into your life, that can push you to your purpose, and you pull them to a place God wants them to be. And one thing about it, any person, if you went through a divorce, and any person coming to your life, they need to be better than the person that was in your life before. They need to have a spiritual connection and a higher standard, hold themselves to a higher standard than the person that was before you in your life before God. Because God is, is requiring excellency to come out of you. So anybody coming to your life, they need to be sympathetic, 
They need to be compassionate. They need to be loving. They need to be caring. They need to be humble. They need to have you your best interest at heart to where they're able to pull you to the place God wants you to be. And if that individual is not holding you to the responsibility of maturing in your purpose and your calling in your life, you need to run from them. Because anybody that God connects you with is for the better, to make you better. And when God gave me that revelation, I said, my God, that is so powerful. Because a lot of times we get with people because I'm lonely. We get with people because I'm broken. We get with people because I don't want to be by myself anymore. And I had to learn, I learned from listening to Miles Monroe a long time ago. When I first went to divorce in 2012, one of his teachings, he said, it's on YouTube, you can find it on YouTube, embracing your singleness. And he talked about embracing your singleness. And he used um, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, where Paul talks about being single. Not only did he talk about being married and even going through divorce. And he used this one point. He said, any individual that have gone through a divorce or never been married and you're single, you need to learn how to be married to the Lord. That stuck with me for many years. Learn how to be married to the Lord. Because once you learn how to embrace your singleness of being single and being, and being celibate and living for Jesus Christ, God requires the best to come into your life. He's the best individual that he knows that's going to he handpicked and selected just for you. To come in your life in the right season, in the right timing, in the right moment of your life where God wants to connect you with the individual to be in your life. And you're going to knit together in unity by the Holy Spirit, not by emotions and not by feelings. And that's an issue. Many people in the body of Christ connect in relation because of feelings. They connect because of feelings. I feel I love you. I feel I care about you. I feel I want to be with you. So they have their emotions unbalanced and they feel it's all out of whack. All because you didn't did something you shouldn't have been doing. And God had to speak to me and said, don't you ever in your life of ministry allow yourself to be reduced down by your emotions or feelings to any relationship. And every person they come into my life. Even when I met LaShonda, I told her the same thing. I said, God says, any man come into your, your life who claim he love you, but he don't love your children, this is a mess for whoever on here tonight. If they don't love your children, they don't love you. They don't love what they can get from you. And you have to be discerning and be aware and on guard. Proverbs 4, 22, it says, guard your heart for out of it flows the course of life. Your whole course of life is set on your humility and your response to God's word by submitting yourself to his lordship and authority. And any person coming to your life is not going to be a hypocrite. Then they're going to be a deceiver. Then they're going to be a wolf in sheep clothing. They're not going to be manipulative. They're going to be one. They're going to love you with the love that Christ has for his bride. My God, I ain't planning to go there tonight, but that's what God gave me tonight, y'all. So number six, hypocrisy. Hypocrisy. When you're proud, you elevate your status. You hear what I just said? When you are proud, when you're stubborn, you're all self-satisfying, you're all about yourself, you elevate yourself to another standard. God doesn't elevate you, you elevate you. One thing the word says, Promotion comes not from the north, south, east, or west, but it comes from the Lord. So your elevation, your status, only will change when you connect to the Lord Jesus Christ. When you humble yourself, submit to his authority, his lordship, your status will be elevated as God sees fit to elevate you. 
Not you decide, well, I'm going to be a bishop today. You're a minister and you tell yourself, well, I'm going to be a bishop. God didn't call you to be a bishop. You called yourself. The reason why the word says many are called but few are chosen. Why? Because there are many people God has called into the ministry, but they haven't accepted the call. So they elevate themselves to another standard where they feel they want to be in God. God didn't put you there. You put yourself in a position that God never anointed you to be. When God anointed Saul to be king, God knew Saul was going to fail. He knew Saul was going to reject. Saul was going to be rebellious. However, for that season, God used Saul to be the king over Israel. And then when Saul rejected God's word and disobeyed God, he anointed David to be the next king. God knows when it's your time of promotion, even on a job. Check this out. I remember I was working <coughs> for a security company. I started out working in the hospital. And as I worked in the hospital, and I, left, I, I prayed about leaving this position in the hospital because I was tired of the stress. I was tired of the, the, the situation I had to deal with all the time with people fighting in the hospital, all these different things. All these events taking place in the hospital. And I worked third shift. And I prayed about it. And I applied for another job which was uh, at the time with Ephons Corporation. And I prayed about this. I said, Lord, I'm asking you to give me this position at this other company. Cause I, I, I said, Lord, I'm tired. I'm getting weary. I'm losing sleep. I'm hurting. All this stuff going on. You know what God did? Not only did he give me the job, but he elevated me to an assistant supervisor position. I was just a regular offer, officer on my job at the hospital, and God elevated me under the supervisor to be a sister supervisor. That's how God does. Anything God does in your life, he multiplies, he promotes, he elevates, he makes better, he takes to a higher standard, to a higher position, in him. The key word is in him, not in you. And then when you find yourself thinking you're better, he said, you think you're better and holier than everyone else. You'll easily find fault with others. Pride produces a hypocritical spirit. Pride produces a hypocritical spirit. And if you know what hypocrisy is, pretender. It makes you a pretender. And you got a lot of pretenders in the body of Christ. A lot of pretenders in leadership. A lot of pretenders as ministers. A lot of pretenders as pastors, a lot of pretenders, as members of the body of Christ. And God is saying tonight, stop being a hypocrite. If you know that you're still rooted and grounded in the sin of any type of adultery in your life, and I'm not talking about sexual adultery, a spiritual adultery, because when you change your relationship with Christ to live according to the dictates of your flesh, you're committing a spiritual adultery. And God says, if you're being a hypocrite, you need to repent and come back to God and ask God to forgive you and restore you back in right standing and right relationship with him through his son. And guess what? God would do that. The Pharisees, hypocritical pride blinded them to their sin and to God's mercy, which made them cold hearted and cruel towards others. And that's what sin would do of hypocrisy. It make you cruel, make you angry, make you bitter, make you offensive to everybody else. So I don't see my own offense that I'm causing on other people, but I'm quick to be offended by somebody else. And that's what we're talking about in our book, Debate of Satan, about offenses. The deadly trap of offense. And so this, this sin of hypocrisy would make you very offensive. Then verse 7 it says rebellion. Matter of fact, let me read this one part. Pride produces a hypocritical spirit. In verse 7, it says rebellion. Rebellion against God manifests itself in resistance towards the word and the spiritual leaders he has placed in our lives. Pride, rebellion, will cause you to resist 
God's word, God's authority, God's leadership. It causes you to get into a place you don't want to listen to nobody else. You feel you're better than the pastor. You're better than the one God placed to watch over us. He said we are to obey them and rule, rule over us for they watch over our souls. And so we feel like I'm better than the pastor. I'm better than the leader he's planted, set in position in the church. I can sing better than anybody else. So my rebellious spirit feels to myself I can do things better than what they can do. I can teach better than he can. I can do this. I can do that. And all the time, you can do nothing without the anointing. Self-righteousness, it comes under the spirit of rebellion. And your self-righteousness will make you feel that I don't need nobody else to help me in the body of Christ. I can get myself right before Jesus the way I choose, the best way I can live. And all the time, you're being blinded by your prideful heart. It is the, it is the reflex of a prideful heart. It also shows itself in a lack of submission. Wives submit to your husband, children to their parents, of, of employees to the to their bosses, citizens to your government. It's a rebellion says, I know better than you, God, when you don't know. So you feel you better than God. Who else did that sound like? Sound like the enemy. Satan felt when he was an angel of light, I can do better than what God could do. Pride was entered. He said, he said, thou was beauty. He said, thou was perfected in beauty until iniquity was found in thy heart. So the enemy was an angel of light, a worship before God until rebellion in his heart. The sin of rebellion. And that sin of rebellion caused him to be filled with iniquity, wickedness. To turn against God and take two-thirds of the angel away from heaven. And because of that, sin entered to the world. And that's what a selfish person would do. That's right. Selfishness comes from the spirit of rebellion. And that's exactly what it does. Because the spirit of rebellion makes you feel comfortable and make you feel secure in your self-righteousness. So I don't need God. I feel I can do better than God. That, that we pray for things. Check this out. God says many times we pray for certain things in our lives we want God to do for us. Or, do, or heal our bodies. Or pray for our children. Or pray for our mother and our fathers. Or pray for a better job. Pray for a better car. Pray for, pray for a house. And because God doesn't seem to answer, and according to the timeline I set, I want him to answer, I jump ahead of God. I will get a house that God didn't tell me to get, and it turned out to be some junk. So now I'm going to the house. I have to fix everything in this house because I didn't wait on God. When God had a house where everything was already functional, everything was beautiful, everything was just the way it needed to be in the house for you, but because you didn't wait on God, you jumped ahead of God and bought the house anyway. So, for example, buying a car. You want a car, and you pray that God give you a specific car, and you want a car that you don't have to do no whole lot of maintenance to right when you first buy it. And so instead of waiting on God, I get impatient. I take the money I got, go buy a piece of junk, which is called a lemon in today's time, go buy me a lemon. And so everything I invest in this car, now I got to keep on investing, keep on investing, keep on investing. So all my money is depreciated because I invest so much into this car. Because I didn't wait on God. The word says, wait on the Lord and be with courage. He should strengthen our heart. So because I don't wait on God, I get ahead of God. I do what I want to do the way I feel is the best result to get the answer to my prayer. Even in relationship, I do the same thing. God says this person you're connected with is not for you, but you say, well, God, they're beautiful. or oh, they're loving. They're caring. God, they, they do anything they want me to do. And God says, but they're prideful. They're selfish. They're arrogant. They're stubborn. They're resisting God. They're opposing God. They're not helping you spiritually. They're just there emotionally. They're only there physically. And because you get stuck in your emotions, you marry the individual, and now your relationship is like going to hell. So everything's just chaotic and confusion all the time. You're arguing all the time. You're fighting all the time. And the person abusive, all these different things because you didn't wait on God. So another point we're going to talk about tonight is the purpose of sifting. The purpose of sifting. Even though Simon Peter 
had received an abundant revelation of who Jesus was, he was not yet walking in the character and humility of Christ. Ain't that something? The same Simon Peter, when Jesus asked the question of disciples, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And some say you're Elias, some say you're John the Baptist, some say you're one of the prophets. But he said, but who do you say that I am? Peter said, Lord, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus responds, the flesh and blood have not revealed to you, but my Father who is in heaven has revealed it to you. He said, because of this, upon this rock I'm building my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. He said, your name shall no longer be, be silent, but Peter, Petro, meaning rock. So because of this, he got a revelation. But when Jesus taught, began to talk about, and he shifted the conversation, that I'm going to be persecuted, I'm going to be ridiculed, I'm going to be crucified, I'm going to die on the cross. Now his attitude changed to selfish pride. No, Lord, this can't happen to you. I'm not going to stand by and let nobody hurt you. You've been with us all this time. It ain't time for you to die. Ain't nobody going to touch you. We all got some Peters in our lives. And the Peter feels they know better than what you know for yourself. And the Peter feels that I have an answer to your problem. And all the time, I know nothing. And because of this same Peter, the disciples began to murmur themselves. When Jesus said, one of you is going to betray me, sitting at the table for the Last Supper, and they begin to murmur themselves, who is it? Who going to betray him? Is it me? Is it you? Is it you? All because they were more concerned about who was going to be the greatest in the kingdom instead of worrying about Jesus dying on the cross. We talked about this last week. They were so concerned about themselves instead of what Jesus had just told them, I'm about to die. And if Jesus was one like us today, just get out. I don't want to talk to you no more. I done told you what's going to happen to me. Forget you. Leave me alone. But no, he stayed humble. Even when he began to argue among themselves and murmur among themselves, he still loved them even to the point of going to the cross. For who is greater, he who sits at the table or he who serves? It is not he who sits at the table, yet I am among you as one who serves. And that's what Jesus responds to his disciples. So even though Simon Peter received abundant revelation, he was still not walking in his purpose, was not walking in humility, wasn't walking in the character that Christ demonstrated before them. He was building his life and his ministry with past victories and pride. He was building from what he witnessed in the past instead of the present that I have Jesus who is the greatest among us who's serving us. And that's what we have to get within ourselves to identify if I'm going to be great in the kingdom, Jesus made it clear that if you decide to be great in the kingdom, you must become a servant. Paul admonishes us in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10, to take heed how we build on our foundation in Christ. We have to take heed how we build on our foundation in Christ. And it's very important to recognize what is your foundation? What is your life built on? Is your foundation built on the word? which is Jesus Christ himself or is built on yourself on what you're doing for yourself. Because we build on the foundation what Jesus talks about then we, we know that we're going to stand firm in the faith of Jesus Christ. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3 beginning verse 10 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 3 beginning verse 10 says, according to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, have laid the foundation and another builders thereon. And this is Apostle Paul talking about the church. Any, every gospel that he preached to the church in the gospels, so the foundation was built on Jesus Christ. And he said, and he's the master builder. And the foundation that I set before you to another builders upon it. 
So the foundation upon the word of God, we build each other up on the word of God to make each other become who God wants to be. He said, but let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. So you got to be careful how am I building on the foundation? And my house being built on sand or being built on a rock? Am I being built on the word of God? Am I built on society, what the world tells me? I have to be careful. Verse, verse uh, 11 says, For other foundations can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So there is no other foundation that you or I, as brothers and sisters in Christ, are to be built upon than that of Jesus Christ, who is the rock of our salvation, who is the word. And when we build ourselves and establish ourselves to be rooted and grounded and planted on the word of God, God erects us. He makes us begin to come bolder and more visible to the world because of the word of God and the gospel that we preach. So our foundation, we get to exemplify Christ Jesus through our lives. So when people see you, they see me, and we're always talking the same language, then they know that, hey, you're built on Jesus. The life that you live, every time I see you, even when I come visit you at your house, you always playing gospel music, you always playing worship music, you always talking about the word, because you're built on that foundation. You have a, such a love affair with Jesus Christ, so anything outside of that is not going to shake your foundation. And that's what we need to be in ourselves to where we can't lay our foundation on any other foundation other than Jesus Christ. Verse 12 says, Now if any man build upon the found, this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest for the day for the day shall declare it because it shall reveal, be revealed by fire and the fire shall try every man's works of what sort it is. So you might say I'm built on Jesus Christ, but when you're tested in the fire of the spirit, it's going to reveal your true identity. The fire going to reveal your true character. The fire going to reveal your true in integrity. Who you really serve who you're really depending on. Are you, are you built on yourself and self-righteousness? Are you built on your prideful heart, your self-preservation? Or are you built in the way God wants you to be that's found in the relationship and identity of Jesus Christ? Because in every work, whatever it is, is going to be tried by fire and it's going to reveal your true nature. And that's where we have to be careful when God says you're going to be tried by fire, that's the reason why, this is another point God gave me. That's the reason why people in the body of Christ find themselves so easy, quick, offended to cut somebody out in church. Because I'm, I'm not built on that foundation. I'm on shaky ground. I'm on sandy ground. Because if I'm built on the rock, I don't care what you do to test, try, and prove me you're not pulling me out of my character. I don't care what you say. How mad you get at me. How, how bad you cuss me out. You're not pulling me out of my character. Because I'm not built in my own self-righteousness. I'm built in Jesus Christ. So the word Jesus says, he told the disciples, when you stand before your accusers, don't think about what you're going to say or speak. For the Holy Spirit himself will speak for you. And that's truth. When you study the word, that's why it's very important as a child of God to study to show yourself approved unto God as a workman and need not to be ashamed. Rightly divine the word of truth. Get in the word. Get the word in you. The word will validate who you are before other people. You are just saying. You get the word in you on that solid foundation built on Jesus Christ. The word itself will validate who you are. It will confirm who you are. It will cause people to respect who you are. Not because of you, but because of who Jesus is in you. Christ in you is the hope of glory. If he's the hope of glory, then he's our expectation that the glory shall come and be revealed in my life. The reason words that Paul wrote in Romans chapter 8, 
He said, the sufferings of this world cannot be compared to the glory which shall be revealed in me. Because he knew that there's a greater coming after this. There's a greater expectation coming after this. There's a greater manifestation of God's power coming after this. So though I might be persecuted, I might be scandalized, I may be cussed at, I may even be beat up sometime, but you're not going to pull me out of my character because I know who I am in Christ Jesus. My God, my God, my God. Goes and says, though unaware, he was still waiting for the transformation of his character. Talking about Peter. He's trying to build his relationship and his, his, his character on past experiences, but still didn't know his character. His reference was from the form of the pride of life. The pride of life. The pride of life will keep you ostracized. The pride of life will keep you on the outside looking in. When everybody else is being blessed and highly favored of God, you still wonder, when is my time? When is it going to happen for me? Because you got a selfish attitude. When you come before God, it said pride would never be strong enough to equip him and fulfill his destiny in Christ. When you in a selfish attitude, your pride is not strong enough to compare with God. Your pride is not strong enough to bring you to the place where God wants you to be in his character, in his nature, in his identity. Your pride will not allow the manifestation of Christ's DNA to be revealed in your life. And that's what God says. If not removed, this pride will eventually destroy you. If you don't allow the Holy Spirit to come into your heart, to reveal the root cause of pride in your heart, you'll never change. you never, never find yourself achieving the vision, the goal, the plan that God has for your life because you're stuck in a cycle, a religious system. The religious system will keep you always stuck in a selfish way, never achieving what God has for you to fulfill in your life. The word tells us, though the vision tarry is yet for an appointed time, but it will surely come to pass. So every vision that God gives you and I, it will never manifest if I'm not built on the foundation of Jesus Christ. If I'm not built and rooted and grounded in my Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, my selfish pride will cause the vision to be negated. It will never manifest. Then it goes on, Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 11 through 19, we see that pride was the same character flaw found in Lucifer. God anointed cherubim, causing him to downfall, causing his downfall. Now we look at what Jesus said to Simon Peter. And, and the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked, you, asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. Luke chapter 22, verse 31. Luke chapter 22, verse 31. Simon, Simon, say that to you. Pastor Terry, say that's God for you. Pastor Denise, Minister Deborah, say that for you. God asks for every individual in the body of Christ, they can sift you like wheat. But Jesus said in response, but I pray for you that your faith fail you not. He says, when you have been strengthened, see the strength of your brother. And that's where our response needs to be when Satan comes to test, try and prove us that we stand sure of our salvation, our personal conviction, our relationship in Christ Jesus, and not be easily swayed by the form of pride. Pride over the door for the enemy to come in and sift Simon Peter. The word sift is translated from the Greek word uh, synizio, which means to sift, to shake in a sieve or fig by inward agitation to try one's faith to verge of an overthrow. In other words, to overpower you, to destroy you, to defeat you. So the sift is a form the enemy wants to use in your life.
to stop you from walking in the plan God has for your life. Now, if Jesus had the mentality many, many have in the church, he would have said, let us pray, let us pray, guys, and bind this attack of the devil. We're not going to let Satan do this to our beloved Simon. But look what he says. But I pray for you that your faith fail you not. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brother. And that's what God wants us to know tonight. That he prayed for us. That our faith will not fail. Our strength not, will not fail. Our belief will not fail. Our uh, expectation in God will not fail. He said that when you have been strengthened, he said, go strengthen your brother. And that's a word for us tonight, is have the attitude of gratitude. To be grateful for the process that Jesus had endured for our salvation. The process he demonstrated by giving himself as a sacrifice on the cross that we can escape the punishment of this world. That Satan's shaking will not overpower us. And that our faith will not fail us. But we stand with sure conviction that I am born again. I'm filled with the Holy Ghost. I'm anointed by God to work in the kingdom as a disciple of Jesus Christ. He told the disciples, go into the world and make disciples of all men, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. He said, Lord, I'll be with you always, even to the end of this world. That's our assignment. Every individual who claims to be born again of Jesus Christ, you have an assignment. Your life needs to be every day on display. Like when you go to the department store, you see the display in the window of a fancy outfit or some jewelry or a, a hat or something that's delicate, that you it looks appealing to you. It gives you a desire to want it. God said the Holy Spirit the same way in your life. We're on display every day of our lives. When we're built on the foundation of Jesus Christ, you're on display. And everywhere you go, you're on display for people to see Christ revealed through you. And if he's revealed through you, your attitude, your character, your integrity, your dependency upon God is going to be revealed through you. Because of what Christ has done for all of us. It became the ultimate sacrifice for our redemption. That we will not die, but live and live in the presence of the Lord as a newborn creature in Christ Jesus. So anyone have any questions or comments tonight? Any questions or comments? Yeah, I'm done. I'm done tonight. We're going to end at this point. But I pray... Just like Jesus did. Jesus knew that out of this trial would emerge a new character. The one Simon Peter needed to fulfill his destiny and strengthen his brethren. Jesus knows you. He knows your weaknesses. He knows your strength. And he knew that the trial that Simon Peter just went through and the things he's going to face after Christ died on the cross and left the disciples will produce a new nature, a new image, a new character to be on display to preach the gospel and save the world. Even though Satan asked for permission to sift them like wheat, he prayed for him as he does for us every day as our intercessor, our great high priest who lives in the body to make intercession for us every day of our lives that our faith will not fail us, but bring us to a revelation and an insight that the illuminated word will reveal your true identity before mankind. So I encourage you tonight, walk in your purpose, walk in the plan God has for your life, don't allow yourself to be distracted, don't allow yourself to be easily offended when other people do things you don't like, 
will say things to you that make you angry. The word says, do not be hasty to become angry, for anger rests in the bosom of fools. Every time when Satan comes to sift you like wheat, you allow people to pull you out of your character, you make yourself a fool before God. And God says tonight, don't allow yourself to be entwined in the spider web of offense. Because that's what the enemy wants to do. It gets you stuck in the mindset of the flesh of offense where you cannot see the break of light through the day shining before you. And God says, when you allow the Spirit of God to bring you to a place of divine order and discipline and humility, no matter how offensive things become to you, you're going to continue to display Jesus Christ. Even though it hurts, Christ will still get the glory out of every situation you encounter. So, Lord, tonight I thank you for this word. Pray God have not fallen from deaf ears. But it brings a change and conviction to all of our hearts, oh God. That whatever in our heart that makes us easily offended, that you change it, God. Purge it out. Strengthen us in our weaknesses that we be strong in your strength tonight, oh God, by your grace and your mercy. Let the power of the anointing fall upon every heart, oh God, that hear this word and perfect the thing that concerns them. That they would take a personal examination to find out what foundation they're built upon. Upon Jesus Christ, upon sinking sand. And that they will repent and return to you, O God. You will restructure, redesign, and redirect them back to the foundation of Jesus Christ. That you will be glorified in all of our lives. And I thank you, O God. This word, Father God, would inspire will edify, will build us up in our faith to trust you all the more. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. I thank everyone for tuning in tonight. I do have a link on here to source, source a donation for the Bible class. It's going, every donation, it goes towards our building project that we have in our church. We're planning um, next year to, re, um, to restructure our church and do the work of the kingdom. For the community and any seed you sow is going towards that and we want to continue to pray for the ministry that god continue to expand and bring increase in divine favor upon the ministry even over all of our lives each and every one of us no matter what you encounter you might have an affliction in your body tonight you might have an infirmity that's been plaguing you i've been going through back pain for a whole week week and a half and yet i'm still trusting god for healing and it all stemmed from when I fell back in May, earlier this year. It flares up occasionally and tries to stop me from doing what God wants to do. But I keep on persevering and keep on pressing into what God has for me. And I thank God that every time I do this, healing is manifesting more and more in my body. And it's the same word for you tonight. No matter what your condition is, don't allow your condition to define your faith in God. Allow your faith to define your condition, what God can do in your body. That's a word for somebody tonight. And I just speak healing and deliverance of every individual on here tonight. Those who lost loved ones, who are hurting and broken this evening, that your spirit, God, will begin to restore the joy of thy salvation. Bring a relief in their hearts and comfort to the broken hearts and bind their wounds, O God, and set the captives free. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So you are here tonight, and you might be a backslider, or you don't know Jesus, your Lord and Savior. The Word says God, he's married to the backslider, and he'll heal you of your backsliding ways. You might be on here tonight, you don't know Jesus, Lord and Savior. The Word says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but should have everlasting life. Then the Word says that, that if we confess our mouth to the Lord Jesus, Believe in the heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So you can be born again tonight. If you're, not, if you're not born again, don't have the relationship with Jesus Christ, I encourage you to get to know him because you never know when it's your time, when God decides to release you from this earth and take you to the, the judgment seat of Christ. And let's pray that you have eternal salvation that's found in knowing Jesus. So I want you to pray this prayer with me tonight. Everyone, I want everyone to pray with me tonight. 
Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you, Lord God, for loving me and caring for me. I ask you, Lord God, to forgive me for my sins, knowing and unknowingly to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Come into my heart and be my Lord and Savior. And I thank you for giving me another chance. And in Jesus' name I pray, amen. If you prayed that prayer, you just got restored, you just got born again, the whole host of heaven is rejoicing over you tonight because you made a decision and a decisive choice to make Jesus your Lord and Savior. And anything else before we go? Any questions or comments anyone have before we go? If you don't, and something comes to you later on, you want to inbox me, go to Charles B. Emery on Facebook, inbox me on that, that site, and I will ask you a question according to the Spirit of the Living God. So may the Lord watch between me and thee while we're absent one from another until we meet again. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you. And may the Lord give you peace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you, everybody. I thank my pastor for coming on tonight. I thank all of you, Pastor Terry. Uh, many of you who join in tonight, I, I pray that you have been blessed on tonight. Minister Joseph, God bless you. My friend Cornell, God bless. My cousin Jackie, God bless you. Amen. Webster, Daniel, God bless you, brother. You stay encouraged, brother. God got you. You know, he, he knows that you're going through the loss of your, your uh, auntie. I pray God continue to bring condolences to your family and comfort to your, to your family to strengthen you all through this time of loss. Amen. Will you all be blessed on the night? Everyone that came on tonight, continue to share this video with somebody else that it will be enlightening to them. And you can also see the link on here to go to my YouTube page and subscribe to my YouTube channel. And you find all the lessons that I've been teaching on there for the last couple of years on my YouTube channel. And I pray that you continue to be enriched in your spirit and study the word of God. That you grow in the wisdom and the knowledge of who God is in your life. Shalom. May the peace of God rest upon your hearts. Have a good night, everybody.